Welcome to Anecdotal Anatomy, the podcast that curiously explores the stories the body holds and tells through conversations, stories, and practices. Our mission is to connect the individual to the collective through our stories, so we may better understand our interdependence and ultimately live a more peaceful coexistence. Is that too much to ask for? Each episode builds from the last and contains kernels of every conversation we've had to date. We cover sciencey things like fascia, anatomy, the nervous system, and other body-based sciences. We also have a pretty high tolerance for the woo factor, which, let's face it, is also energy and should not be discarded as if it has no value. We are nature-loving, yoga and meditation teaching podcasters that could, aiming to make the world just a little better than we found it. Our motto is, leave no trash trace, we're only visiting, but leave your heart print with every step. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Welcome oh to, what is it, two days after uh, Christmas? You have a house full today, don't you? We, we've got a lot going on. It's after Christmas that we're recording. It's the 27th. And um, I've got kids going here, going there, going everywhere. So I'm sort of in this chaotic space. And I, which I find funny because we're going to be talking about patience today. And I feel like I've had to practice a lot of that recently. You know, we've been doing the yoga eight, but we thought we're going to not, we're not interrupting it. We're just pausing, not even pausing. We're, we're following a line of thinking. We're following what it is that we started and that, you know, we talk about the different limbs of yoga, but how does that actually show up in our lives, in the world? And so we're going to kind of stop after the fourth, we're right in the middle of the limbs. We've done the yamas, the niyamas, asana, and pranayama, the observances, the, rest the restraints, the observances, the physical practice, and the breath control. So we thought this would be a good time to kind of take all of that information and try to figure out what that means at this point, like before we move into the sort of, you know, withdrawal of the senses and meditation and single point of focus and bliss and like this next more loftier part of, I won't say loftier. I did say loftier, loftier. You know, the other day you were talking about it and our conversation kind of centered all the way back again to season one, how when we were discussing discussing the koshas the first koshas are tangible it's the body and the breath and now here we are again in yoga eight coming to this bridge this segue between the things that are tangible and that you can grab onto and feel asana the uh the yamas and the niyamas really having this tangible body somatic experience of the breath and before we move on this is a great time to pause and look at different lenses. Like how do we look at these practices, not only in the way this is the practice, but what are all of the different transitions that can be made in a yoga practice as we dive deeper? And I guess that's where the patience comes in. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, you know, not just the koshas, but the chakras also, the first you know, three are very tangible. They're earth, water, fire, you know, and then we get to the heart chakra, which is air, the element of air. And we've said this before that some say it's the ceiling to the lower chakras and the floor to the upper ones. So I'm kind of pausing here, feeling into this idea that we are at the ceiling of the, you know, sort of limbs and the floor of where we're going. So there's a lot to kind of unpack here. And yeah, you know, both of us are decades long practitioners. So we have, we have the gift of perspective that not everyone has. You know, when I got into my teacher training, there were some trainees who had just started yoga a week before or a month before, and I'd been on the mat for 12 years. And so Amazing. not that I, I mean, and many of these people who were, had just started were way more advanced in the asana practice than I, because their bodies lent themselves well to finding those shapes and finding that balance between effort and ease. And so that wasn't so much, that may have been their yoga, you know, that, that they were doing and now sort of expanding into the different limbs. But my body doesn't respond that well to asana. I mean, over the years it has, and I've understood it a little bit more. But the patience piece, if I always think time is the balm, it's the salve. They always say, you know, give it time. Time will heal all wounds and all of that. These pithy aphorisms that we can kind of throw out there. 
But there's truth to that. If we let time, if we give time the benefit of what it does, then we gain perspective. We get to learn from the things that we've done. We get to see the progression and the regressions that have happened. Uh, which I think are just as valuable. Like impatience is something to look at. If we're going to talk about patience, we also have to honor the impatience for what it what it gives us. So, you know, we've got the shadow and the light. We've got, I think I've said this before, when I worked at Wetlands uh, Rock and Roll Nightclub in New York City, my favorite stall in the bathroom underneath the toilet lid, it said the urgency of now. And I think about that a lot, the urgency, that urgency and impatience can share the same space but I feel that urgency has, has a purpose. Impatience just feeds our cortisol and it feeds our, you know, unhappy hormones, as it were. <laughs> yes, our unhappy hormones. I like that. Rather than happy hormones or stress hormones, they were just unhappy hormones. We talked about, you know, making the transitions from the more physical to the things that are less tangible. But this week, my son... Uh, he is a mountain climber, hiker. He also has a sit spot and a meditation practice. Uh, but I got a text from him who said, we're taking a yoga class at the climbing gym. So as part of the climbing gym, which is a very physical activity, but does require a ton of focus. If you're going to be climbing the side of the mountain, you want to be present and focused while you're doing it. So he says, I'm going to take this yoga class today. We've not really taken yoga. I think he's done one or two of my classes, but not a yoga practitioner by any means and took a vinyasa class. And I checked in with him later and said, how was it? And he, his response was the movement with the breath and the focus and the meditation added a new level of interest to just having a seated meditation sit spot practice so they don't they're not really separable just like everything else we blend we we integrate we incorporate all of the different practices and sometimes we can look at one practice and say this is what i'm doing i'm gonna do my meditation practice but our breath comes into it our mind wanders so focus comes in so we're constantly coming back and reminding ourselves that practice and patience. I don't know that they are synonymous, but they could kind of lay in that same train of thought that practice takes time. Patience takes, you know, this concerted effort to say, I'm just going to release, let go and let time do what it does. To be curious about it, because not all impatience is bad. You know, I don't like mm. to reduce things to good or bad. I don't live in that sort of binary code. But I think that like words, we've talked about stress and resistance not being just a negative thing, that there is also, there are lessons, there's, there's something to take away from that. And I think the same is also true with impatience. If we look at it and we, like you've said in the past, that sometimes your sadness comes out as anger, you know, that things are not always what we think they are. And so it might it might take a couple extra steps of inquiry to be able to get to that place. And the other thing about impatience or patience, I should say, is that I think it does take practice for some of us to be patient. But so this idea of in yoga, facing things right on, and that sometimes when we get impatient, we avoid it instead of moving into it. So sometimes like the woman who does my body work for me, I'll go in and I'll talk to her about my story. And sometimes she'll balance it by doing the opposite of what it seems. So I am feeling really heavy. So she'll do a light sort of touch. If I go in and I'm saying I'm feeling really, really light and I'm floating off the ground, she might give me a more heavy grounding kind of experience. And then sometimes if I come in all, you know, sort of really high energy, She'll give me a high energy to meet me where I am rather than try to balance it because it's a different experience. So the same thing with patience and impatience. I think if we are naturally patient with something, then Stira and Sukha, how do we kind of recognize that path or what it was that got us there? Where the other side of impatience, if we can meet it, if we can say, okay, I'm feeling really frustrated or impatient, I just need to get where I'm going. And then we realize there's so much out of our control. And, you know, what is the, the purpose of feeling all this ajita, all of this impatient energy in my body? It could just be 
that, you know, take a breath, do a practice so that there are practices and then there are results of practice. So practicing patience, we're not really practicing patience. We're meeting it. We're doing practices. We're breathing. We're meditating. We're like this morning, my meditation was so chatty. I had so many storylines. I've been doing this for fucking years. Sometimes it's really easy to kind of come back. And sometimes it's just a train off the tracks. And I just got to, you know, make sure we're not crashing into something, you know, bigger than we are. So many storylines there. You talked about like this self-inquiry and, you know, coming back to patience, you know, patience is, is a really, uh, it kept coming up while you were talking, like this inquiry takes time and time. I see time as the opposite of patience, not the opposite, but if I had lots of time, it would be easy for me to be patient. But sometimes I'm running through my day, trying to get this done, trying to get that done, that impatience is the energy of the day. And as you were talking, you said, you know, so if you find yourself being impatient, do a practice. And I had to chuckle to myself because I was like, okay, so I'm running around, right? Maybe other people feel this way. I'm running around. I'm trying to get things done. I'm feeling really impatient. Probably the last thing that's going to come into my mind is, okay, why don't you take a pause here and dedicate 20 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever to the practice. But it is so healing when my, when I actually do say, okay, you are just like frenetic. You're running all over the place. Impatience is exuding from you. This is the time that that practice would be the most beneficial to just stop and rest, but not always e It's not easy to have that realization no. and just say, I'm going to stop now. And we've had this conversation before, like, I, but even you, I'm not paying attention to my breath in the acute situation. But what happens is with time, with practice, with consistent practice. So maybe it's not about practicing patience. It's just about showing up every day and being curious about what that is, what happens when I practice my, my rituals each day with mindfulness. So now since when I stopped practicing, uh, teaching public classes, it was largely due because I no longer felt like I was growing as a teacher or a student. I felt like I needed a teacher. I needed someone to help me get from where I was to that next place. But this was 22 years into my practice that I felt like I had really hit a hard stop. And so I stopped teaching. I started doing my own thing. And then we started doing this. And all of a sudden, maybe not all of a sudden, 24 years later, I realized that I am my best teacher. This came up in my meditations the other day, but I needed to learn how first. I needed to learn how, what the practices, what the techniques, how, what they felt like in my body. I needed to absorb all of that. I needed to fill my cup to overflowing. And now I feel like I'm in a point where I'm beginning to empty that cup. I'm beginning to say, okay, I've been fed by all of these voices and all of these teachers. And now I get to experience what it is that I've lived and practiced through consistently over these years. So it took me 24 years to learn how to be my best teacher. And the reason I'm saying this is because we hear it all the time, you are your best teacher. And early on the path, it was overwhelming. I felt a serious impatience to get to the point where like, how, am, how can I be my best teacher? What does that look like? What does that feel like? And am I ready to? And all of these questions that came up that overwhelmed me, that I brought in a sense of impatience. And now that I have the gift of perspective and I can look back and having taken, made the choice to move into this part of my learning, of my teaching, of that communion of energy that you teach me so much, our listeners teach me so much. Our, the students who show up at our, at our programs have been teaching me. So I'm back in the feeling of, of, of growth as a teacher and a student. And that happened because I took a break. I paused. I looked back. I did the work of inquiry. I do it every day. And so now I look back and I see where patterns have been interrupted. I see where now I'm doing things in the moment that I could never have done before because I didn't know how, and I didn't have the, the thought to do it. So that has changed. That has evolved over the years. So even since we've been doing this, I'm now more capable and equipped to look at my breath in acute situations. I'm more equipped and knowledgeable and able to pause in the middle of a, a crazy situation, take a breath, and even walk away from it. 
That's the patience. I still get a little impatient because I want to say stuff. Like we're talking, okay, that's good, Teresa. Now I, I, I have something I want to say. Like that's still an energy of impatience that lives inside me. But so when I was looking at the chakras, as which chakra is associated with, impa- with, with patience, oh my God, every single one of them, one leads to the next. So if you're grounded in muladhara in your root chakra, then there's ground for patience. Then you have a steadiness. Now, this only works when these chakras are in alignment. When we're out of alignment, that's not going to matter. You know, patience, impatience, you're still just trying to find ground. But once you find your ground and you will have this steady space, patience is much easier. When you get into Svadhisthana, the second one with the water going with the flow, when you are aligned with Svadhisthana, you can be the water, you can go with the flow, and there's patience there. When you get to Manipura, which is fire, all of, you need the patience when that's aligned to be able to peel away from who you thought you were all this time to become your most authentic self. And that's the fire of transmutation that allows us to move into that. If we're impatient, then we're not going to get to that authenticity yet. If we get to the, the, the practice of the heart, like the heart chakra, that this is, you know, love, how we give love and receive love. You know, some people may also have that impatient energy that you meet with them. How do we balance that from the air, the space of love? Vishuddha, this is the one I was just sort of inferring. This is our throat chakra, our communication center, not just talking the impatience of let me in, let me in. I have something I need to say right here, right now, but the listening piece. So I'm working on, on bringing that into balance and into alignment by practicing my listening. And the better I get at listening, the better I also get at patience. So then all of a sudden we move into Agnia, this intuition space. And that is, I think it's similar to Vijnana Maya Kosha, you know, that sort of the wisdom sheet, the one that gives us perspective. And when we have perspective of that, it's hard not to be patient because we can see the hows, the whys, the whats, and the, all the stuff. And then when we get to Sahasrara, the crown chakra, which was the first thing that that I saw that was aligned with patience it says when aligned, the crown chakra brings inspiration, intelligence, and patience because we're connected to that divine energy. So in that divine timeline, all timing is divine. So we're exactly where we need to be. We are in no hurry. There is, there's just the, the mental piece that we start fucking with ourselves and we're like, oh, but we need to do this now. And uh, when, if we just trusted, and surrendered Ishvara Pranidana, we just surrendered to that divine energy that would all line up, I think. Yeah. I think um, <laughs> alignment, yeah. We're, 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 that's what we're working for, right? For everything to align. And that's where the patience comes in. It takes learning, it takes practice, it takes understanding of what that alignment even looks like before we can do it. You talked about the practice of self-inquiry and just paying attention. And this inquiry practice, I think of often as listening to the mind. Yes. When we come into mindfulness, we're trying to get the mind to allow the thoughts to flow rather than getting stuck in gnawing on whatever that conversation may or is. Um, But at the same time, that inquiry that I'm approaching, I'll, I'll use myself, that inquiry is one that I feel is a calling to let the brain be quiet and maybe the heart too. But I find the practice of inquiry, mindfulness, meditation to be a step to hearing what my heart has to say, to listen to the heart's intelligence and the heart's voice. And I don't know about anybody else, but for me, I don't think that's something pre-yoga that we're taught to do. We're taught to think and figure it out and find solutions. And these are all brain activities. To listen to the heart in a way with inquiry and patience, for me, has brought in the moments of the greatest joy, but also the moments of the greatest sorrow and possibly fear because the heart has the answer. Things I'm trying to figure out more than my brain because the heart is the center of emotions, feelings. It's, it's the sensorial part of the communication process rather than my very left brain. Hey, Teresa, do this and this, and here's step one, and here's step two. But 
sometimes that resistance, that impatience comes because if I believe my heart always knows the answer, sometimes there's a fear. Maybe if I know that they, it's an answer, that there's a fear. I don't want to hear always the answer the heart has because it shows a lot more vulnerability. The brain is just, my brain anyway, is going to say, do this, do this, do this. It's very step orientated. It's, you can, if you want to get from here to there, do those things. But the heart, we kind of meander on a trail that has a lot of switchbacks. And sometimes I feel if I get too close to hearing its authentic feeling, I can see the fear, like, do you really want to go there just yet? And so the patience is stop or the patience to sit with something that might not be as comfortable when we really are in the inquiry of being our own best teacher. We have both, I have both my best amazing times and my saddest in that, that show up in that inquiry and everything in between. Like everything else, the heart doesn't live in a vacuum. It's, it's associated, it's relational in a way. I mean, maybe it does have its own space, but the heart and the mind are have a conversation with me every day. And the mind often, it's the overrider. It's the one, it's the stira, it's the boundary, it's the, the, the hard stop. The, the air element of the heart feels boundless. And so in the worlds of stira and suka, you know, where I feel like I live a very sukha heavy life, this sort of the more ease than boundary, I would say that it's probably the opposite in a way in my body, that my mind, like med, that's why I, I practice meditation so that I can work with my mind, so that I can work with my thoughts, so that it doesn't override the heart. And what I find interesting is when we're doing this inquiry, like, who am I? Because yoga really is the study of self. That's, you know, and so the asana piece, that's why I get a little bit like, oh, not just asana. And I told you this morning in my meditation, I kind of came to this thought that, you know, if asana is the only, is the only yoga or they're showing up every day and just mindlessly doing the yoga and listening to what other people are saying to do every day, it's kind of like running on the treadmill. It'll, it'll work with your body. It'll work with moving your mind and your thoughts and all of that, but the view never changes. And so to recognize, but I, and when I thought that I was like, mm, but I did public classes for years and the view kept changing. And but there's a point at which we then get to be our best teachers. But then going back and thinking, but who am I? Am I more left brain, right brain? Am I more heart driven or mind driven? You know, I came from a very academic family and I never felt like I fit into that part of it because I was not. I didn't love reading until after college. I didn't do the work. I did the bare minimum to get by and in a family that was all pretty academic overachiever. But so I looked to the things that I gravitated to. I gravitated to theater, a very creative space where I could do that inquiry a little. I mean, and it's just as vulnerable. It's not more or less vulnerable because you're not lying. You are inhabiting a character and finding their truth, but you can only find their truth if you're willing to do the work on yourself. Because it's kind of like, mask work. You know, you've got to hold the mask next to your own face to see where the similarities are. Where is the most authentic truth coming from me that I can give this character breath and life? I also gravitated to the Grateful Dead. You know, I went on to not big national tours, but if they were on the East Coast, I was going to see the Grateful Dead, especially if they were in New York or in Philly, New Jersey. You know, I was, that. those were my people. And going to rainbow gatherings where it would take days for me to let go of the, the boundaries and the borders and the shit that I put up so that I can live in this, this world. And once I was able to do that at a rainbow gathering, patience wasn't even really an issue. It just was. Everything lived in the pool of the heart and the reflection of, of each other and ourselves in each other. And don't get me wrong, there are assholes in every group of people. You get more than three people together and you don't see the asshole, it's you. So like, I, I'm not trying to create a utopian vision of what this is, but just that that's where my heart was leading me into these types of activities and groups of people because they resonated at the frequency of my own heart. And so to find that balance and to be able to also recognize the power of my mind, sometimes over my heart, within my heart, is still part of the process that I'm going through to figure out who the fuck I am. Well, if you figure it out, please let me know what the secret was, because I, I could use that figure, that uh, that pathway as well. But I think we're on it. 
But yours and will I, be different than mine. Yeah. So which, I don't know if mine will help you, but you'll be the first to know. But it is the path. And that's where we, where I think this was birthed in one of our conversations, the patience of practice and, you know, how many different ways we can bring the practices of yoga. It's, you know, you can kind of look at it as the crib notes of life. There is all of these different practices all laid out. I'm not expected or nor are you to dive into every single one of them at the same time and master them. But, and there's not even for me, a very specific order that says you must do them in this, in this order. There's a lot of different practices that are available. And I found a way to help with my patients by, and a lot of that happened in this year of inquiry that you and I have been doing together by stepping back and noticing how many of the practices were in my life, but I didn't really look at them that way. I didn't look at, say, something really, really simple, which is the niyamas and a practice of cleanliness. Like, this is one of the yoga practices. And, well, I don't take a shower every day. I just had a conversation with the whole family about that, nor do I wash my hair every day. But I clean my house, I wash my things, I wash my hands. So in that, there's a simplicity in looking at the patience of practice, looking at the rituals that happen in life and not taking them for granted. Oh, I come in, I wash my hands. Like I, anybody who has seen me physically knows that if I'm outside and in most situations in the winter, I have hand warmers on. I go out, I have hand warmers on. No matter what it is, usually I have them on in the house, except I forgot to put them on. So if you're seeing this, they're not on. <laughs> but one of the parts of my practice of cleanliness is I have outside hand warmers, which are fingerless gloves, and inside fingerless gloves. My inside fingerless gloves never leave my house. It's kind of an interesting practice of cleanliness, but I come into my home at my door. I take off my fingerless gloves that are my outside gloves, wash my hands, and put on my inside ones. So the only thing that ever touches them is me. Now that I'm saying that, that sounds like I'm really carefully. No, you know, but there's a balance there too, you know, so I think that the consciousness piece of it makes it a practice, mm -hmm. gives you a sense of this is what I'm doing. I think there's a line in everything for all of us if we are going to extremes so I know we've talked a little bit about the germ phobe and a little OCD on that. So, you know, when we get to those, we get to say, okay, what's the practice now that I can accept a few germs into my life, you mm -hmm. know, so that it's not all one or the other, that we're not rigid in our practice, but that we can have space for other things. Like I do my practice in my bedroom and sometimes I'm lying on the floor and I see the dust bunnies and the dogs are always walking in and out and thinking, I don't know what the fuck is crawling in this nest of, a ha of hair that I have right now. And I just don't care, <laughs> you know, but then I could up the game by fucking sweeping the floor maybe before I, you know, or, you know, mopping it down. So I'm, I think the opposite extreme of you, uh, but there's that, that ground that we get to, to find, you know, and the whole thing about the, all of the things about yoga that can draw our attention, it's like our lives, what are we drawn to, to kind of understand ourselves a little better. You know, I'm not a scholar in the deities, but because I love mythology, that became one of the first things that drew me. So for my final project, for my teacher training, I did a practice called Mythasana. And I took all of the poses from our favorite book of the mythology of the of myths of the asanas. And I told the story with each one because I had a teacher who once told the Sita Ram story in Warrior Two. She told half of it on one side and half on the other side, longest Warrior Twos ever, but it turned me on. And then there were like the chakras, the energy wheels, that drew my attention. Mantra and chanting, because I love to sing and I'm always singing. These are things that were relevant to me that, that drew my attention within the practice. And then when I hear other people who are scholars in pranayama or they're scholars in philosophy, and I love learning about those things, but they weren't the things that drew my attention immediately, but they still turn me on a little bit when people, you know, are able to share their scholarship. And so there's enough to, 
to absorb, to, to, to be a student of. And then there's all the stuff that we get to, to, put, to put forward as teachers. So to be kind of, you know, and we go to a, a training, and I know this is true for many of us, and we're always cautioned, don't just teach it the next day. Practice patience so that you can absorb it, you can allow it to marinate, that there's, there's an essential time once we learn something that we get to just feel it in our bodies. We get to, you know, play with it in our minds. We get to do the work of, of really understanding it before we put it back into the world. Now, there are times we'll learn things that are so close to so many other things we already have done that work with that it's easier to turn around and teach sooner. But I think as newer teachers, there's an impatience to get it out there and to show all the things we know and, you know, to kind of, to, to be that teacher. And I think I was in the beginning for sure. But, you know, that's something also that's an essential lesson along the way. We get to be new teachers. We get to fall down and we get to do the extremes. But then it's our job to recognize that, take a breath, pull back and be completely honest. Like I learned something today, which we'll get into later. It shocked the shit out of me. And my first impulse was, I need to know everything about this before I talk about it. No, I need you to know that I know nothing about it so that I can share it and we'll talk about it when it comes up. Yes. And the patience you had mentioned earlier about being our own best teacher and what does that mean? And I'm going to use that example in relation to asana. So I'm a massage therapist. I use my hands and my wrists a lot in my work. I've had surgery on my hand. I've broken my wrist. You know, I've had some injuries. And I was coming into my asana classes, my mat classes, as a student and then as a teacher, and recognizing that as I was leaving my practice of sun salutations and vinyasa, my hands and my wrists always hurt. And so now, becoming my own best teacher, I'm listening to my body. And I didn't want to. I was like, well, if I can't do all of these down dongs, if I can't participate in arm balances, I was guilty of saying, well, then I can't do my yoga. So I have to show up, right? So we learn, we keep moving forward, but I can't show up. However, as I started to think about it and being a teacher, other people were coming up and talking about similar things, shoulder discomfort, wrist discomfort, and the patience of listening and hearing that I wasn't the only person experiencing this, this discomfort, but also feeling like if I don't come to the class, then I'm not doing my yoga. My teaching started to change. I started blending more of what I knew from body work into yoga. I even told people I can do one or the other. I can do down dog or I can see clients. I'm going to choose to see clients and I'll figure out something else for down dog. And I started teaching slowing down. I began to share what I was feeling in my own body. How do I move around this? How do I know the pattern that is contributing to this discomfort? And for me, that was soft edges. And initially, it was moving slow to feel the soft edge in your body. When do you first start to notice a tightness, a stiffness, a twinge of discomfort? And my brain was processing it very much. Okay, listen to what your body is telling you. What are those muscles? What does that fascial system tell you about your movement? But the more I had patience enough to practice and listen to myself being my own teacher, I would find that I would slowly move into a certain shape. I'm going to use a twist as an example. I would slowly bring my arms up over my head and think, oh, this feels so great, and exhale and twist to one side or the other, looking for that soft edge. And I started to notice that sometimes the edge wasn't physical. Sometimes I would start to approach something in the twist and I would feel like it took my breath away. And I was like, whoa, that's, that's energetic. Or sometimes I would get to a certain expression and my brain would start telling me stories. And I began to realize that with the patience it took to say, I can still practice yoga, I can still practice asana and movement, I can offer it in a different way. But it started to blend all of the limbs together 
and asana being one of the inroads to notice, huh, when I get to that shape, it's hard for me to breathe. Not because my body doesn't know how to breathe, but because somewhere in there, it's like, you know, we've all said it took my breath away. Sometimes our breath is taken from us because something is so amazingly, stunningly gorgeous that you're like, that scene was so beautiful, it took my breath away. Or sometimes it's just a place in the body where something, something, a memory, a trauma, maybe a joy, who knows what, is stuck. But I began to notice it as a call to slow down, to say, you know what? I don't really look like I'm in a twist, but this is where I'm getting a message. So I'm going to stop here. And this is my perfect alignment right here for this movement. And um, it changed how I practiced and hopefully some of the students that I was guiding. Oh, I'm sure. And I know as one of your students, it definitely did for me. You know, as I'm not a body worker, I, I don't have that background. It is challenging for me to you know, move into my own proprioception. And so being my own teacher, like I said, it took me 24 years to get to the point where I feel confident to be my own best teacher. Because, you know, pigeon prep, when you're in that pigeon pose that is like, you know, uh, what is it? Free bird, you go to a class, anytime you go to a concert, what do you want to hear? Free bird, what, do you, what pose you on pigeon? pigeon. Well, without the, the external eyes on me, I would be very comfortable allowing my the hip that's usually up to fall down and be out of alignment and have it feel good in my body. But over time, that is not going to feel good in my body. It feels good in that moment. But if I practice that misalignment that I can't see or really feel without the benefit of having that external teacher's eyes on me to bring me into that alignment, either verbally or hands-on, then over time, my SI joint is going to say, fuck you. And it did. <laughs> it actually did a couple times. But there was also a mental piece to that. There's a whole story there. So I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a slow learner. I've always been someone who kind of I'm always late to the party. I I just not really like I'll either show up on time or early or not at all. But but in terms of my practice and in terms of my goals and and my life, I've always been kind of just what is the the term when you're just a late bloomer? I've always been a late bloomer. And so it makes sense for me that it would take me 24 years to be able to embody enough to feel confident that I don't need to parrot other people's words anymore. I don't, I can take what I've learned and create something within myself, filter it through my own experience, my koshas, my chakras, which is going to be different from anyone else's. And so I had to learn patience on that. And I don't think I really understood that until fairly recently. You know, I really thought I was moving through the the different levels. And I think I was to whatever degree I was, again, divine timing. I feel so grateful to be here now. Thank you, Ram Das. Be here now. That it just, and all of the things yet to learn. So I'm going to get to the thing that I didn't know that blew my fucking mind. So we just did the yamas and the yamas. And we used Deba Deal's book. And she's amazing. I'm, I just love her so much. And I'm looking, I went on to Google because I thought, let me just see, what is the yama or niyama associated with patience? And it kept coming up, number five, yama, patience, kshama, kshama, kind of like kvetch in Yiddish. You know you're not Jewish if someone says kvetch, it's kvetch. So this, I'm thinking it's kshama, <laughs> not kshama, but kshama. And it talks about the fifth restraint which would in the book is a parigraha in the, in the lessons I've learned, not possessiveness. You know, what is this? I don't really know if there is a connection or I haven't done the study yet to see if what lineage this is from or why there are like three more yamas in, the, in this list than I've ever seen before. But Kishapa, it says a couple of things here. Oh, which I love. Oh, where's my paper? Here it is. It says, patience. A word I find easier to say than actually embody as a result of finding small ways to foster patience is a daily luxury for me. I love that. For Kishama, it says exercise patience, restraining intolerance with people and impatience with circumstances. Okay, we know easier said than done. You know, you're in a situation, I'm so impatient. Yesterday, I actually had an opportunity to practice not filling the cup of someone else who did not want it or need it in the time. All I did was listen and then walk away, which is, a, is new for me. <laughs> be agreeable. Let others behave according to their nature without adjusting to you. 
like that. You can still meet people where they are without you adjusting them or having them have to adjust you. I think that's what what being in balance and being in community is is about. Don't argue, dominate conversations or interrupt others. I'm still working on that. All of those. <laughs> Don't be in a hurry. Be patient with children and the elderly. I am much more patient with the elderly than I am with children. Working on that too. Minimize stress by keeping worries at bay. I find worry and guilt unproductive, so that's not my biggest challenge. Remain poised in good times and bad. So these are these are practices we do, but all of this is predicated by awareness. Awareness must have must be there. So practice or kshama, the fifth yama, is essential to the spiritual path as the spiritual path is to itself. This is from uh, Shiva, Shiva Dharma. Focusing on living in the eternity of the moment overcomes impatience. And I just actually wrote something the other day that talked about practicing stepping into the eternal of each moment. And this is what that's saying. But kshama, listeners, do you have an experience with kshama? Do you know, do you know more about it, please? Email us at anecdotalanatomy at gmail.com. I am so curious about this, but I'm more curious to hear from voices who've done the work rather than Googling and getting some, you know, academic thing that is filtered through an algorithm rather than a heart. So if you know about Kshama, please, please let us know. <laughs> that new learning, when you mentioned that before we hit the record button, I was so intrigued. I was like, there's something completely new. I'm looking, we've studied, we've researched. And the first time that we're hearing this is both a, wow, there's just that next step. And I kind of get really curious. I was not a great student when I was young. I did not have to do a whole lot to walk home with that B. See, and now there's where we're different. You didn't have to do much to get the B. I didn't do shit and I came home with D's and F's. <laughs> I, I didn't come home like I, I would have to put in all the effort to get the B. Mm, yeah, I just, I'm a good <laughs> listener, listening and hearing. And, you know, my teachers were kind of nice. They did their tests 90% about what they lectured in the class rather than what was in the textbook. I don't know if that was nice, good, bad, or what it was, but I knew that if I showed up and I just listened and paid attention, I would be able to do okay. So that's the kind of student I was until I went to massage school and really became curious really, really curious about how our body works. And, you know, massage school was a little bit after my yoga practice, but once that curiosity to learn to dive deeper was ignited, it kind of billowed out into everything that I was interested in. But the patience comes in, in the realization that when I mastered one thing, you talked about, you know, studying with different teachers. As I mastered or whatever mastered means, you right? Need a got, new word for that. Yeah, whatever I got. Better word. When I got efficient or let's see, what can when we do? When you filled your cup. When you filled yes, your cup. When I was just felt like I could offer because I learned it, I practiced it, I embodied it, and then it was time to offer it. What happened in almost every class I would take, every CE class, everything I was learning, was instead of walking out like I did in high school going, got it, now where are we going after school and what are we going to do? I would walk out with thinking about what's my next class. Wow, that was so interesting. I learned all of these things. But I started leaving with as many questions as I had answers to. And that's where the, the patience in practice is, is that I found that I could learn, I could study, I could share. And as soon as I felt comfortable sharing whatever that thing is, there was the next thing to learn. It was like, hmm, I'm not done yet. And thankfully, I probably never will be, or I hope I never am, in that there's always the next place to go. There's always the next thing to learn. And from yoga, in yoga, and all of these different practices within these eight limbs, it sounds like Oh, I have eight things to learn. That won't take long. But those eight things are so deep <laughs> with so many different ways to experience, embody, read about, share that those eight things are definitely multiples of eights. Right. And the first two are actually 10. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. no, 18 things. One of the things I know you love, you love mudras, the hand gestures. And I found this one, which I misinterpreted when I first read, which I love. I'm going to practice this in my car when I, for the beginning of my Dharma at the wheel yoga for road rage. But this is something from a Niyama yoga patients. Uh, I started reading it before, which is often when looking for opportunities to boost inner feelings, this author turns to mudras. Mudras are hand gestures that allow you to elicit a deep inner wave of power into your practice while simultaneously stretching stiff fingers and bringing increased sensitivity back to the hands. Yet these same hand gestures are powerful nonverbal ways for any of us to connect with our practice. So what she says is, is what is it? That in yoga, the middle finger represents Saturn, which is associated with patience. So that was the first line I saw. So I immediately just gave the finger. I was like, oh my God, I do this in the car all the time. I'm actually practicing patience when I flip the bird to the asshole on my bumper. Oh my, this is awesome. And then I kept reading. She said to practice this mudra, which is, what is it called? I'll get to it. Practice this mudra, press the tip of your thumb representing the ego and the tip of your middle finger practicing patience. My fingers start shaking when I do that with the middle finger. So when you bring the patience together with the ego, like, I find it interesting. Right now, I'm a little bit steady, but my fingers would shake, you know? And I'm thinking, what is that? My ego is the piece that is keeping me from being patient because I have something to prove or I, by getting done the thing that needs to get done now. Or I have something to prove. I need to learn everything I need to learn about this so that people think I'm, I'm as academic and smart as the rest of my family. You know, whatever the ego thing is that is keeping me in the space of impatience touching it with that patience, it actually brought a physical tremor to my hands. But as I sit with it, and you can sit with it on with your hands on your lap, palms face up, you can sit with them turned out, however you want to express that. But it's a physical representation of drawing patience into our lives. Does she say anything else? She says, for moments when I need to foster patience, it's called Shuni Mudra. Together forming a circle, remaining fingers can extend out or open to the sky. You can begin your practice with this mudra, come to a seated position, back of your hands gently resting on your knees, thumb and middle fingers touch, and then continue to use it throughout your pose sequence when you require additional focus. So this idea of patience and focus, for patient, we can sit with whatever arises. And when in meditation, when thoughts arise, we have to recognize it and then draw back to the breath, but we can be with it rather than avoid it or resist it. We can allow ourselves to just, you know, be with the flow. Being with the flow is the definition of patience. It could be right? one of them for it sure. Could be, yeah, it's one of them is to just be okay with what's going on. And patience is, for me, is something that many times I think, well, I have so much patience. I can just sit and listen and wait my turn and do all those things. Being number five of eight, you kind of have patience built all around you. Even, you know, to get the um, the plate of mashed potatoes as they're coming around the table. It's like, ooh, my favorite food. When's it going to be here? But, you know, being at a table with 10 people, there's patients moving all that stuff around. But also I realize that sometimes when I lose my patience, it's explosive, right? That, you know, you can have either one. I can be patient and calm. So... Like everything else, there's the yin and the yang. There's the degrees of the practice of patience. And sometimes I master it. And sometimes I walk away from a situation thinking, what the heck did you just do? Because I and just completely lost it. And I am exactly with you. So when the, and I call it rage, I get a rage that comes out. And what's interesting to me when I've done the inquiry around that is that there was a runway that it didn't just come out of nowhere. There, was, there were steps, there were moments that preceded that, that were patient, that were inclusive, that did give extra for what, whatever was external. But whatever that stimuli is that then all of a sudden encourages that rage to come out, it wasn't sudden. It, was, it, it built to that moment. So I can give and give and give and give and give from my authentic heart and feel the patience of a wide embrace. But when there are things that are not coming back to create a cycle of communion. We give out energy, we receive energy. When we're teaching, it happens with our students. When, it, when we're on the stage, it happens with the audience. Here, it's happening with each other in an unseen audience. 
with our families and children and parents and spouses. I mean, it's always we put out, but something has to come back. So if whatever's coming back is not in balance or in in alignment with what I feel I'm putting out, whether it is or isn't, it's my perception of it, then at some point I have a breaking point. They call it the straw. They broke the camel's best, you know, but that the camel was walking the whole time in the desert. The camel was doing its thing, and but it was just that one last thing. When I lived in New York, we had books, these bookshelves, and I just, I thought they were in really well, and I put all these books on there. And one day, Brian is, and he's sleeping, I put one paperback book on that shelf, and the whole thing came down. I think that's really what I'm trying to say. It's like the whole shelf broke out of the wall. That one tiny little paperback after, you know, holding all that load for all that long. Maybe it's there's only so much load we can hold at one time. You know, I don't know whose back's that strong. Maybe find out before too long. It's always a dead lyric. It's gotta always, go yeah, we got to go back to the <laughs> dead. They had, some, they had quite some nice array of wisdom to share with us. But I guess all of this is to say that any practice, it doesn't matter what it is. It takes patience. It takes commitment. It takes self-love, self-inquiry. And, you know, just knowing that as soon as one thing is accomplished, as soon as I'm like, oh, I got this, I got it. The next thing is just waiting. And isn't that what keeps life interesting and flowing is that we look at one thing where, you know, try to learn how to do, oh, what, how come I just forgot that? What pose were you talking? Swan. I'm, I'm a, a pigeon. Pigeon, um, sorry. Style. Pigeon and swan. Yes. Yin. So it's like learning to do pigeon. We learn, we practice, we practice, we practice. And as soon as I'm like, whoa, I'm in alignment, this hard pose, I worked it out. Somebody comes in and says, guess what we're going to do next? Camel. And I'm like, oh, camel, not camel. <laughs> I have a whole new part of my body to feel and experience and notice. There's always, always the next step of where I'm progressing to, what I'm learning, and what stories I'm going to find along the way. What are the stories that are being held in my body? Sometimes they come out because I'm in a physical practice, and sometimes because I have the patience to sit with it, whether it's in a mindfulness meditation or just a sit spot to just sit, be patient, and let things come and go as they're going to without feeling like I need to always control mm -hmm. the situation. Which is an illusion anyway. We know this. We all know this. But so if practicing patience, I know we've got to wrap this up, but if practicing patience feels overwhelming, just show up every day. Don't worry about practicing patience. Don't worry about patience, I think, is the result of practice. So meet your impatience, show up, sit on your cushion or on your mat, let the discursive thought come in, recognize it and come back to your breath. Just keep doing it. Just keep showing up and let us know over time. Because remember, time gives us the perspective to notice these changes and see how, how your patience threshold has, has increased or, or changed in any way. But we love you and we're so grateful that you listen to us talk about stuff that we care about and hope that you care about too. Mm. And with that patience, while you just showing up, remember, kindness and compassion for self just because you showed up is also a really great, great practice to put in your practice. So if you're showing up and you're on your cushion and you're thinking, gosh, I'm so impatient because my brain just won't stop talking, then, right, as Sherry says, when she guides us, label it thinking and come back to your breath. There is no judgment here. Just label it thinking, and come back to noticing your breath. So thank you for sharing that with me. And thanks to all you for being here and being a part of the conversation. Until next time. Later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening, for rating, reviewing, and subscribing to our channels and other stuff. Thank you for inspiring us to have these conversations and to create contemplative live experiences that move our bodies, hearts, and minds to the rhythm of our highest selves. Thank you for showing up. Feel free to send us your stories, questions, and comments to anecdotalanatomy at gmail.com. As always, we want to thank our amazing editor, Judith George, Keith Kenny for our fun music, 
and Cindy Fatsis for our photos. Journey with us as we continue down the roads of discovery, taking the detours and meeting the mysteries. You are our why. See you next time.